Well, howdy. Hey there, everybody. Did you have a good week? Did you miss me? I, I missed you totally and not in a weird way or anything. Just, uh, yeah, it's good to be back. I will cut to the chase. Today's video is the next in my series, my ever growing series on the bestsellers. I will caveat the Publishers Weekly list of bestsellers in America. So we're going way back to the beginning. The first one was in 1895. And by now I'm all the way up to the bestseller of 1898. And that book is, drum roll please, Caleb West, Master Diver by F. Hopkinson Smith. Now the eagle-eyed, sharp-eared masters of memory among you will remember that F. Hopkinson Smith already had a bestseller on this list. He wrote Tom Grogan, which was the bestseller of 1896. And he did seem to like uh, naming his novels after people after the main character, basically. Uh, the difference with this one is that Caleb West is not the main character. Caleb West, the novel, is published by Houghton Mifflin. It was published in 1897 and again in 1898 and became the bestseller of 1898. My particular copy has 378 pages. It has 26 chapters, which instead of being numbered have chapter titles, some of which are quite good. I particularly liked Among the Blackfish and the Tomcods, The Song of the Fire, and my personal favorite, Under the Pitiless Stars. There are nine illustrations done by two illustrators, Malcolm Fraser and Arthur I. Keller both of whom were fairly prolific at the time. Arthur I. Keller did a bunch of Sherlock Holmes illustrations for which he is still remembered. Now the frontispiece is interesting because it's not an illustration, it's a photograph and there is no credit that I can find. So I don't know who the guy is and I don't know who took the photograph, but it is supposed to be of Caleb himself. The novel is well written and an enjoyable read, much like uh, all the novels so far. Actually, it's um, it's readable. Like even for the time, there are some big words, but it's it's nothing that's going to trip you up. It's in a relatable narrative fashion. I'll read an excerpt here, which is description that particularly struck me. The Indian summer days had come, soft, dreamy days of red and gold with veils of silver mist at sunrise and skeins of purple clouds at twilight. The air was hazy with the smoke of dull fires smoldering on the hillside. The stems of the bare birches shone white. Wreaths of scarlet crowned the low stone walls. Dead leaves strewed the lawns and tall chrysanthemums flamed in the garden beds. Here and there a belated summer rose, braving the cold, shivered with close folded lips or hung head down pierced by the night frost. Now, a rundown of the characters. We have Caleb of the title, but he is more of a secondary protagonist next to Sanford. Sanford is referred to as a young engineer. Barely any of these characters are given specific ages, but he certainly has some experience, so he isn't that young. Currently, Sanford is working on building a lighthouse, which is the main focus of the story. Now, Sanford has the great unspoken love with Mrs. Leroy, who is a moneyed married woman who helps him out in a lot of his ventures. And of course, she is actually married, even though he is not. She is unhappily married, but nonetheless, she is a steadfastly loyal to her marriage vows woman, and he respects her for that and would never question that. There's also Captain Joe, also not super old, he has some gray hairs, but anyway, he is a salty dog who knows the sea better than anyone. He heads up the crew for Sanford's projects. 
There's his wife, Auntie Belle, who is um, the sort of woman who always has food on the table for anyone who drops by and room at the table. If there isn't room, she'll make room. There is a young swain of um, Sanford's acquaintance, Jack, and Helen, the gal he is pursuing. Helen comes to visit with her uncle, the endearing Major Slocum, who is one of those older gentlemen who's got a lot of bluster, but also a lot of kindness and sweetness to him. Now, the central antagonist here would be Carlton. He is an unscrupulous government superintendent who has to um, review Sanford's works and sign off on them. And he likes to find fault whenever and wherever he can. Also, there is Sam, Sanford's servant. There are a lot more characters, but those are the, the main ones we'll be concerned with. Now, as in his previous novel, Tom Grogan, uh, Smith has a lot of engineering knowledge and he pours that into his work. So there are both accurate technicalities and he knows how a crew works together if it's a bit idealized and probably sanitized for the novel. Also, as became obvious in Tom Grogan, the author was um, probably not a big fan of, I don't know if it's government or unions necessarily, or even the regulations, but he seems to feel that when you get personalities involved, they use those things to overstep their bounds and cause problems. And he definitely showed that that can be an issue. After all, you can't let that interfere with good, honest men trying to do good, honest work, as it were. Now, there are two main plot lines to this. As I said, there's Sanford's project of building a lighthouse, which underlies everything. And then there's Caleb and his wife, Betty. Now, when it comes to the project, both Carlton and the sea itself create problems for Sanford. A problem for Caleb comes in the form of Bill Lacey, who is a young crew member who becomes injured. Caleb's wife, Betty, tends to him, and then they run off together. Betty realizes her mistake pretty quickly and comes back within a couple of days. However, although Caleb does forgive her, he refuses to reconcile with her. He believes that she still loves this other man, and so he refuses to get back together with her because he feels that she won't be happy. Now, when it comes to the drama in the novel, I found the plotline of Sanford and Mrs. Leroy's um, forbidden love, as it were, more affecting than anything else. Although there's a part where Captain Joe is almost lost to the sea, and that was pretty affecting as well. Now, Sanford's project and Caleb's relationship both have hurdles, but spoiler alert, I, I always have spoiler alerts, they were overcome at the end. Now, I'm not exactly sure <laughs> about Sanford and Mrs. Leroy's relationship and what happened. I, I, I was a little confused by it. Um, there was a conversation they had where she gave a reaction that confused him and then it kind of saddened him and changed his outlook on the relationship, I think. At the very end, she is reflecting on that and telling herself that she did it for the both of them. So it seems like she did it on purpose in order to put a rift in their relationship and that was because their relationship was never going to go anywhere. So although it hurt her, she did it for the best. I think that's what happened. All I know is uh, that was the very last thing in the book. And I read it and went, what? 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 No, what happened? Ah, help! No, you can't end it that way. So I was very invested in their relationship more than anything else. Now, it, it might be surprising that an author as popular as Smith was at the time, two bestsellers in a few years, is not more well-known today. And this novel, although it is well-written, offers a couple of clues. 
First, there uh, would be the relationship between Betty and Caleb, husband and wife. Caleb is 45. Oh, so old. You can tell by his, his picture. I Yeah, that, that super old looking guy, 45. I, I guess people did look older then. Anyway, his wife, Betty. Her age is not specified uh, that I recall. She is referred to as a very young woman. Alternatively, sometimes she is referred to as a, quote, child bride, unquote. I do not think they mean a literal child. I have her placed, um, particularly with the illustrations, I have her placed in my mind as somewhere from 18 to 20. Could even be a little bit younger people to get married younger than. However, <laughs> even at 18 to 20, that is a very big age difference. And although that does happen nowadays, it's it's certainly not as, as common or as uh, accepted as it once was. I come to think of it, uh, even some characters in the book are questioning it. Like, that's, that's a pretty big age gap, dude. <laughs> Now, when Betty runs off and comes back, um, there's much concern for her reputation. Uh, to their credit, several main characters do forgive her. She is so sweet and kind, and they know her so well. And they're like, she just got her head turned. She made a mistake. She realized her mistake really quickly. She came back. Let's forgive her and we and defend her and let her move on with her life. However, at that time, there weren't so many options for women, and that is definitely demonstrated because basically her husband has to forgive her and let her come back in order for her to really be accepted in the village because there is no other real path for her. Now, Caleb does forgive her, as I said, but he will not let her come home, not until the very end. And then thankfully he does because uh, there is no other thing that she can really do. Captain Joe and his wife allow her to live with them and she gets a small job working somewhere. But that's about all she can do because there are no other options for her, as they point out. And the fact is that if you're not going to allow women to have other options and, you know, see the world and see what other options they could have, then, yeah, of course that's the only option for her. And, you know, it's a, it's a little hard to take nowadays. Especially because she is very fortunate that she has a very kind husband who genuinely cares for her. Uh, I mean, what, it, what if there was a, abuse or something going on? She would have absolutely no recourse. So yeah, it's, uh, it's different to read this nowadays. Now, even so, that's not the main reason. Uh, that would be the depiction of Sam, Sanford's servant. Sam is a black man. And he is depicted in a racist manner. Now, he is shown to be very good at his job. I mean, for heaven's sakes, he cooks so many different things and he's so good at them. Wow. I mean, this guy's a gourmet. Um, but he is, he does also speak in a broad dialect. And he is uh, described as not being all that smart somehow, even though he's good at gourmet cooking. Um, and this is pointed to as being because of his race, uh, his, his being descended from, etc. It just, oh, it's, yeah, it's tiring, let's say. It's tiring. So, although this book has its strengths, as I say, it's, it's, it's well written overall. It has strong if uh, somewhat dated, uh, themes of man versus nature, of sacrificial love, of honor and loyalty and hard work and doing the right thing. It does come with a few caveats. Now, granted, the time was what it was. I really started experiencing life roughly a hundred years after this novel, right? Uh, child of the 80s, teenager of the 90s. And 
Even in that time, looking back on it, I can see now with the virtue of hindsight that sometimes things that are around you, societal mores, as it were, sometimes they're so prevalent and accepted that you take them for granted and you don't even question them. And I think that was much the case here. However, that said, racism is just wrong. And I wish the author had questioned that and not included it. To be clear, such depictions and prejudices were wrong then, they're wrong now. So that is definitely something to take into consideration if you're going to read this book or any book like that. Well, that covers this book. So um, yeah, I'm not going to go into, I usually have something about the author, but I already did that in my Tom Krogan video. So, you know, go check that out. I can uh, try and link it down in the description if I can figure out how I'm still a little fuzzy on all that stuff. Um, or you can find it in my um, bestseller playlist. So let me know if you read the book. Have you read anything by F. Hopkinson Smith, which is not either of these two novels. He did write several others. And uh, what are some classics that might not be on this list that you recommend? Always want to know more books. I will see you next week. Have a good one. Read books, see movies, enjoy life. Bye! Again, this is another book that was owned by somebody else, Mary E. Sherwood, 1898. That means she was the original owner of this book. I wonder if anybody else has owned it since, and what she was like, and what became of her.